This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Andy Ferguson and I'm pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street Church. You might have to be as old as I am to get the full importance of this story. Still, anyone who lives in this contentious time will appreciate the example a powerful Republican and a powerful Democratic Senator said about 35 years ago. At the end of a long day in 1973, Senator John Stennis of Mississippi was headed home from his office on Capitol Hill. He was looking forward to a bit of relaxation when he got home. After parking his car, he began to walk toward his front door, and then it happened. Two young men came up out of the darkness, robbed him, shot him twice. News of the shooting of Senator Stennis, the chairman of the powerful Armed Services Committee, shocked Washington and the nation. For nearly seven hours, Senator Stennis was on the operating table at Walter Reed Hospital. Less than two hours later, another politician was driving home when he heard about the shooting. He turned his car around and drove directly to the hospital. In the hospital, he noticed that the staff was swamped and could not keep up with the incoming calls asking about the senator's condition. He spotted an unattended switchboard, sat down, and voluntarily went to work answering questions and offering reassurance to worried friends of Senator Stennis. He continued taking those calls until daylight. Sometime during the next morning, he stood up, stretched, put on his overcoat, and just before leaving, he introduced himself quietly to the other operator. I'm Mark Hatfield, happy to help out. And then Senator Mark Hatfield, a liberal Democrat, unobtrusively left the hospital the press could hardly handle this side story. Everyone assumed that there was no way for a liberal Democrat to give a conservative Republican a tip of the hat, let alone spend hours helping in such an out of the way role. This is the first Sunday of Lent, the season of preparation, as we make our way to Holy Week and the cross. Christians have often given up something as a means of honoring Christ and keeping a spiritual discipline. Too often the things we give up are the sweets or extra helpings we should not have been taking anyway. Too often Lent becomes just another fad diet. So this time we are urging instead Lent as a season of service. Let us find ways during Lent to be servants in the world in the name of Christ. The preaching scriptures we will use throughout Lent will be passages that speak of service Passages where Jesus is teaching Christians the importance of service or the examples of Christians in service. This Sunday, we begin with Jesus' parable of the great judgment. It is found only in Matthew chapter 25. I hope you'll get your Bible and turn to Matthew so you can read along with me. We will read together in just a few moments. First, however, let us listen to our parish adult choir as they sing, Love Bade Me Welcome.
Now we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 25, begin with verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep at His right hand and the goats at the left. And the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food? or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger, and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison, and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as that you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It is God's word for God's people. Let us pray. God of heaven, we do give thanks for the grace that you give to us each day. Now give us the grace of understanding and of, of keeping this word which you have given to us through the Holy Scriptures. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. The Christian faith has two great pillars in the parables of Jesus. First is the parable of the prodigal son, a lesson about a young man who dishonored his father by demanding his inheritance early, sold everything he inherited at yard sale prices, and then wasted his fortune in a place as far away from home as he could run. And when he came to himself, he went home to his father where he was received with love and forgiveness. We respond to this story because all of us prodigals love to come home to the loving father. This experience unites us. Jesus Christ is our savior from sin and our hope in this life. The second great pillar among Jesus' parables is this parable of the great judgment. This is ethics while the prodigal son is grace. This one speaks of Jesus Christ as the Lord, who sits in authority over all the peoples of the earth. As my mentor pointed out to me years ago, the message of this parable is that because Jesus is Lord, we are finally accountable for the lives that we have lived. The parable of the great judgment asks whether those who call Christ their Lord have shared simple things with those in need, a cup of water for the thirsty, a bit of bread for the hungry, did Christians come and share friendship with the lonely or visit those in prison? The parable takes the ordinary, water, bread, friendship, and elevates them to the level of the holy. The parable focuses on what we do or fail to do. We're good people and that we keep a good reputation. We do not break the law. We keep from evil. But what about the good things we fail to do? This is the focus of the parable, our sins of omission. The parable asks, what have we not done that we ought to have done? The parable opens by setting the stage. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, then He will sit on the throne and all the nations will be gathered before Him. In other words, history is going somewhere. Our lives and the history of the world are going in a direction from the creation to the fullness of the kingdom. The creator of the universe is also the destination of the universe. Do you believe this? Or do we believe something else about the destiny of the world? Popular thinking offers other models. 
You see, when we believe differently, then we behave differently. You know other ways of looking at this world, of course. Some believe that the history of the world is one great circle, cycling back around every year or every lifetime to start over. If time is just a returning cycle, then history is a great series of Groundhog Days, not really progressing morally, intellectually, or technically. Every family and every nation goes through a predictable life cycle. If, on the other hand, history has a beginning in God and a direction, then we're not required to repeat the mistakes of the previous generations. We and all society with us can find better ways. We can improve on the prejudices and the injustices of the past. We can work for the kingdom that God is surely bringing in God's good time. Another possibility. I know people who live, live as if the Big Bang Theory is not just an explanation for the creation of the universe, but is also the logical, catastrophic end of life as we know it. It begins with that old thought, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Think of it as the final bang theory. The day will come when governments and institutions will not be able to hold together the tensions stirring the peoples any longer. Perhaps a conflict in some remote corner of the planet will get out of control. Think Crimea, Iraq, Iran, the Central African Republic, and Venezuela, the list goes on. Perhaps an asteroid will hit the Earth, dead center, causing a decade of nuclear winter. Perhaps all the movies about a zombie invasion will be correct after all. If the final bang is our end, then what difference does it make how we live or the ethic we keep? Well, it does not matter if the final bang is our destination. But Jesus begins the parable of the great judgment by setting the scene. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, then He will sit on His throne and the nations will be gathered before Him. Thus the world and history are going somewhere. It began with God and its destination is going to be God. Now a division begins. The sheep, the righteous, go to the Lord's uh, right hand. The unrighteous, the goats, go to the Lord's left hand. The startling insight given by this division is that it comes through some very ordinary events. You gave water to the thirsty. You gave bread to the hungry. You welcomed the stranger. You gave clothing to the naked. You took care of the sick. You visited the prisoner. You did all of these things, or you did none of them. We expected a more sophisticated ethic than this. This is everyday stuff. Many of us imagine ourselves dealing with the great issues of life and death. I've always imagined myself deliberating with the UN Security Council around issues such as freedom, economic well-being, self-determination, and the like. But most of the time, my life is spent on the level of Andy of Mayberry. From overhearing conversations at Panera at nearby tables, a lot of other people live at the level of Mayberry, too. What is our response when the thirsty, the hungry, the stranger, the naked and the rest appear along our way. Jesus is telling us here that these are the core questions of the kingdom of God. What did you do for the least? What did you and I fail to do? A new insight for me in my preparation for this sermon is that the, le is that the least we are called to serve are the brothers and sisters of the Lord. They are not the Lord himself. Now, Popular piety would have us see the face of Jesus in the face of the needy, and that's, that's a lovely thought. But there is a, a time to be a biblical literalist, and this is one of those times. The parable does not say that we serve the Lord when we serve the poor. We serve the brothers and sisters of the Lord when we serve the poor. And the distinction is worth noting. Popular piety that sees the face of Jesus and the face of the poor is sweet, but it misses an important point. The poor we serve are just that, real people with hard-to-solve problems. We are not free to spiritualize them or to imagine that they are somehow Jesus in disguise. Such mental twisting reduces the poor to mere avatars in our personal morality dramas. We take away their humanity, their warts, their unreasonable choices to imagine them whatever we want them to be. We fail to see them real. We idealize them and then get disgusted when they fail to make good use 
of the things we offer them. Jesus claims the thirsty, the hungry, and the naked as his brothers and sisters, so much that serving one of them is, serv is a serving of the Lord. He calls on us to deal with the hungry who keep coming back to soup kitchen after 30 years, who sometimes set the mulch around the church on fire with their cigarettes, as someone did last week, who approach us for money on the sidewalks of town. These are those whom this Lord claims. Note in the parable that those who are judged to be the sheep of the Lord's pasture were just as surprised as the goats who were driven away from the Lord's presence. Neither one knew that the needy they met along the way were brothers and sisters of the Lord. All those who were brought for the judgment had encountered hungry, thirsty, needy people. The difference is that some saw a needy person and offered comfort. Others saw the needy person and saw an inconvenience. The story is told of a Christian who became increasingly troubled about the problems in the world. Every news report of uh, abuse or crime was the occasion for a desperate prayer. How long, O oh Lord? Every needy person along the commute home at the end of the day brought out the question, what is God doing about that? Every story of war or famine in a faraway country led to an impatient question, where is God when that is going on? Well, the Christian died, peered at the gates of heaven. God was there welcoming others who'd arrived just moments before. So there was a little time to, to think before our Christian arrived before the Almighty. This is my chance to ask. All my life I've wondered. So the Christian came to the head of the line. God held out a hand in welcome. Christian was not ready. Why did you allow the bad to happen? Wasn't there anything you could do? Christian asked. The Almighty looked confused and then replied, I sent you. Didn't you know? Now remember that the good we do is to be done in Christ's name. We are servants of the Christ. We are not called to look good while serving. We are called to serve in Christ's name without looking to see how we look. Richard Foster, in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, put together a brief comparison of the characteristics of service that is focused more upon ourselves versus the service that is focused more upon Christ. In paraphrased form, it becomes a helpful way to examine our motives. Self-focused service is concerned with impressive gains. It enjoys serving when the service is titanic or growing in that direction. Christ-focused service doesn't distinguish between small and large. It indiscriminately welcomes all opportunities to serve. Self-focused service requires external reward, appreciation, and applause. Christ-focused service resists con uh, content in hiddenness. The divine nod of approval is all-sufficient. Self-focused service is highly concerned about results. It becomes disillusioned when results fall below expectations. Christ-focused service is free of the need to calculate results. It delights only in the serving. Self-focused service depends on feelings. Christ-focused service ministers simply and faithfully because there is a need. The service disciplines the feelings. And self-focused service insists on meeting the need. It demands the opportunity to help. Christ-focused service listens with a tenderness and patience. It can serve even in silence. As Jesus told in his parable, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are my, members of my family, you did it to me. Let us begin a season of service, offering ourselves to serve the world and our neighbor in Christ's name. Jesus keeps noticing the little things a cup of water for the thirsty, a bit of bread for the hungry, clothing for the naked, or an hour of friendship for the lonely. He is that kind of Lord. Let us be that kind of servants. A graduating student at United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, had just received his appointment from the bishop. He was complaining and grumbling because the appointment didn't fit what he felt he deserved. Another student in a loving but unsympathetic way patted him on the back and said, you know, the world is a better place because Michelangelo didn't say, I don't do ceilings. He lifted up Jesus for his friend to see because he understood that to serve 
is to follow. And if you stop to think about it, that's the spirit of servanthood. The world is a better place because a German monk named Martin Luther didn't say, I don't do doors. The world is a better place because an Oxford Don named John Wesley didn't say, I don't do fields. Go from the beginning of the Bible to the end, and you will see over and over again the story of men and women who had servant hearts, minds, and spirits, and the world is a better place because Moses didn't say, I don't do Pharaohs, because Noah didn't say, I don't do arks, because Jeremiah didn't say, I don't do weeping, because Moses didn't say, I don't do speeches, because Rahab didn't say, I don't do spies, because Ruth didn't say, I don't do mothers-in-law, because David didn't say, I don't do giants, because Mary didn't say, I don't do virgin births, because Peter didn't say, I don't do Gentiles, and because Paul didn't say, I don't do letters, and because Jesus didn't say, I don't do crosses. As we reflect on what it means to be a Christ-focused servant, let us listen now as our soloist Carolyn Craig sings, sings The Lone Wild Bird. As we come to the close of our time, I'd like to extend an invitation for you to join us for worship at Church Street Church in the nave at 8.30 a.m. or 11 a.m. We gather every Sunday there to lift our praises to God. I invite you to join us in that beautiful place. Also, I want to invite you to, this, uh, to the community Lenten services. They begin this coming Wednesday. The first one happens to be at Church Street. It begins at uh, 12 o'clock and or a few minutes before and then it will conclude at 12.30. Following that will be a soup, salad, lunch downstairs in our parish hall. You're invited to be a part of that community service. It is a wonderful time as the, the churches of the downtown area come together to offer these unity services. Also, our congregation has prepared a book for the coming Lenten season. It includes devotions written by members of our congregation. And if you would like to receive a copy, We'll be glad to give you one, a complimentary copy uh, just for calling 865-521-0299. We would love to share this book with you as we, we prepare our hearts for the season of Lent. I also want to mention that 
the, the, the Wednesday services that we're used to having will be moving with the community services over the season of Lent. So our regular Wednesday service will be moving with that community service. Well, in closing, I am Andy Ferguson, pastor at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. I thank you for letting me share this devotional time with you in your home. And now as I go, my wish for you is that you might live each day like out of the corner of your eye. You've just caught sight of God and realize that God is headed your way. of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. Rejoice.